All right, so uh, what we're going to be doing uh, today is uh, going over uh, PID basics. Um, so PID um, topic in itself could be a whole in person full six, seven hour class. There's the stuff you could do with it. But we're just going to be talking about the basics, um, going along, setting up a PID loop, um, showing how you would set it up. And then we have a video that I'll show you where you can see how easy it is to set up on our drives. I will just be talking about some of the commonly used functions that are associated with PID. Uh, so first off, uh, what is PID? Uh, so PID stands for three different terms. It's a proportional integral and derivative, and it's a control process or a control loop that regulates a variable. And that variable would typically be like a temperature or pressure or flow or something like that. I'm trying to regulate a certain level. Or value. Uh, so for VFDs, what we'll usually do is we'll have a transducer, 0 to 100 psi transducer, some kind of inches of water column transducer, and that's going to be our feedback. Then I'll provide feedback from the system to the drive for an analog input. Then the VFD will also provide a set point, whether it's pre programmed or going to some kind of speed pot or you know, from some other system. Uh, the VFD is going to see the set point, and then it's going to try to automatically adjust and regulate motor speed to achieve, you know, the most stable feedback that's close to the set point. Okay. That's really all a, a PID loop is. Sometimes people get confused because they'll open up a book and they'll see a crazy, you know, table like this flowchart that's showing all these processes and parameters and everything like that, and then they get a little bit overwhelmed. And we get a call and they're like, how do I set it up? And it's actually not that bad. It's pretty easy. You could get a PID loop going with just, uh, I think, like, you know, four or five parameters. You can always add on to it, of course. There's a lot of different options within, you know, this whole ID process here, but it's pretty it's pretty easy. So that's what we're aiming to uh, achieve here to show you guys how easy it is to set up. So starting out with some of the basic stuff here is uh, what is a process loop? So sometimes you'll hear, oh, I need process PID or I need some kind of process on my line or something like that. Um, so process loop is um, a control loop that uses a feedback. So you have your control system that would be like a VFT. If you add some feedback in there, then it becomes a process loop. The feedback device is closing the loop uh, to regulate you know, your speed. But going a little bit further, um, the process loop is gonna contain a few things. It's gonna have a manipulated variable, a controlled variable, a controller, a sensor and a control element. Okay. If we look in here, here's a little bit of a flow chart. Hopefully, you guys can see my mouse. Uh, but you have your set point, which is usually like a preset set point. You have your controller, which might be like a VFD or something. You have your manipulated variable and a control element. Okay. Then, <clears throat> then you have disturbances in your process. So that could be uh, temperature going up or down or pressure going up and down, you know, because you're opening and closing valves. And that goes back to your sensor, to your feedback loop, and back to your controller. So it's just a big loop. That's why they call it a process loop. So here's a couple examples that may make a little bit more sense, a little bit more uh, real world examples that you guys run into. Uh, first off would be an HVAC example. We're in an HVAC application, so you're controlling a, a fan. So the fan and the airflow for that fan is going to be the manipulated variable, okay? And then, of course, that fan is going to be connected to a motor. So if you increase and decrease your speed of the motor, which is your control element, you're going to be able to manipulate the airflow amount. Additionally, you'll have a feedback loop with a pressure sensor, okay? So you'd have a pressure sensor in your ductwork or whatever, and then you could detect what the air pressure is, and that's telling the controller Hey, go fast or go slow based on your set point. Okay, so same diagram, just a big loop. One more common one would be a uh, tank fill. So a tank fill is going to be very similar. It's going to have the same components where you have a uh, level sensor, okay, which would be like your feedback device. In this case, it would be a 0 to 10 volt signal, so it's an analog signal. Uh, you have a fill pump, you have an evacuation pump, and the VFD is only going to control one. And in this case, it's a tank fill, so we're controlling the fill pump. But later on, I'll show you guys an example of a uh, pump down application where we have an evacuation pump um, connected to a VFD. Okay. 
can have an adjustable set point set up in the VFP, and then it's all the same variables. Okay, so the manipulated variable in this example would be, you know, the liquid input, and you have your liquid level in the tank, which is the controlled variable. So we're trying to control how high or low that tank goes based on a set point. Uh, you have your controller, which is the VFD. Uh, the control element is going to be your pump and motor combination. And then the sensor, in this case, it's like a level sensor. So it's a photoelectric level sensor. That, that hopefully should answer when you guys would use this. Another common one is just like a standard pressure um, PSI loop. Um, that's what we do probably 95% of the time. Whenever people are setting up PID, they have like a pressure transducer. You know, maybe it's an irrigation or a booster pump, something like that, and they just want to regulate to a certain PSI. So another thing we got to know about is what is what is error? Okay, so now we're we're getting into the details of kind of what's happening behind the scene when you set up some parameters. Um, so feedback, which is read by the controller through the sensor, so this is like your analog input, your pressure feedback or whatever that's connected to the drive. That feedback is compared to your set point. Okay. If we look at this line down here, let's say your set point is 60 psi, but your feedback is a little bit of an overshoot and it drops down a little bit. You know, the VFD is trying to stabilize. There's going to be usually a difference between those two. So the difference between the set point and the feedback is the error. And um, so, how the controller is going to adjust the output of that PID output block is based on the calculated error. And also the aggressiveness of the PID settings. We're going to be talking about how do I adjust a PI a gain or a P gain in an integral time. You could add in a derivative if you want, but uh, those settings are kind of what eliminates the error and gives you a more stable operation. So once you get these set up, a lot of times we'll hear from people, oh, it's not responding fast enough, or it's a little bit sluggish, or we got some overshoot. Uh, that's when we get involved with the tuning of the PID stuff, and we're, we're going to talk about those parameters as well. First off, error is the difference between the feedback and your set point. And you, will, of course, want to eliminate error as much as possible to make a nice, stable, and tight uh, PID system. Here's, uh, again, looking back at that big function block uh, diagram here. And this is only part of the function block diagram. This is from the uh, IS-7. Uh, so I guess, first off, you should note that all of the uh, LS drives have a uh, PID loop in there, even the entry-level M100. All the way up to the IS7 and the H100s, they all have PID capabilities in there. There's no limitations there. This uh, diagram is from the IS7 manual. Um, so you can see you have your PID reference right here, then you have your PID feedback right here. We kind of take two, and then we figure out, hey, what's the difference between those two? That's the error. The first thing we calculate is the error. That's the first part of that whole uh, line of. Uh, Right there. Okay. So here we kind of get involved with some of the uh, the tuning. So I'll show you guys how we set up the drive, of course, uh, a little bit later. Um, but we got to know a little bit about what these terms are that we're going to be looking at and testing and stuff. And the first off is the uh, proportional gain. This is often the first thing you adjust. This is like the simplest form of compensating for that error. The difference between the feedback and the set point, crank up that gain, and you should be able to eliminate the error. Okay. So the output of the proportional term is going to be a multiple of the error itself. So that means the higher you crank up your uh, proportional gain, the more aggressively the controller is going to react and it's going to try to compensate for that error. You got to be careful because if you put it up uh, too high, it'll overcompensate. Um, and if you leave it too low, it's not going to be able to compensate enough. And that's when you have like kind of like sluggish um, operation, or if you ever change your set point, it's really not going to react too well. It's all about fine tuning. That's what makes PID stuff fun. And uh, when I say fun, that was sarcastic for those of you guys that have ever played around with PID. It could get you. So a very similar uh, drawing here, you see your set point, which is usually solid. Um, then your PI, PI output right here, this would be like a sluggish response, right? It's not even reaching our set point, okay? So if we look a little bit more at the proportional gain, uh, this is a nice uh, little table here, which is showing if the proportional gain is set too high, 
Well, that means you kind of uh, are making the uh, PID loop too aggressive. Um, so you're going to get oscillation. So your your PID output should be matching your set point. You're getting pretty close. But you can see it's overshooting. So it's going above, it's going below, it's going above, it's going below. And in the real world, this um, PID loop is controlling a, controlling a motor and a pump, right? Or a motor and a fan or whatever you're trying to control in your process. Uh, so that's not going to be good mechanically with the constantly going up and down. Um, so that's when you got to go in there and you got to, you know, decrease your gain a little bit. This is another table here, which is a representation of uh, the effect of increasing your gain. So uh, we call this value K. The value of K1, so that'd be like a gain of one. It's really not going to be, you know, aggressive at all. Okay. It's going to be a little bit sluggish. You have a very, like, um, low slope here, not very aggressive. Uh, but if you have it uh, double your gain, so number two, it's going to get closer, you know, to your set point, but then it's still kind of a little bit uh, conservative, so it doesn't actually hit the level. But if you go really high, like a five, well, then you have all this oscillation again, and eventually it's going to uh, even out to the end of this here. So this axis down here is time, but it's going to take a while to get there. So you might want to put this at maybe like, I don't know, two and a half, three, maybe try a four and a half or four. And then you might get a better um, better reaction here, a more uh, finely tuned system. Okay. So first thing we're talking about here is that proportional gain. So even if you set it like, you know, the, the best value possible, you may still have some oscillation. You may still have some sluggish response there. And it'll actually never have the set point match, you know, the, the steady state of the PID. Okay, so you'll you'll never have your feedback match the set point. Um, and so when there's a constant difference like that, what what we call that is that's called an offset. Okay, very very similar to the error almost. Okay, so whenever whenever there's a difference between the steady state output, the PID, and the set point, this is the offset. So if we go back one, that's kind of what we were seeing here. It was never matching our set point, right? So that's an offset. Um, and that's because up till now, we've only been using the proportional gain. We're looking at the proportional gain and how it works. But uh, we'll never completely eliminate that offset with just the uh, proportional gain. So no matter how high you turn up that gain, it's not going to help you. And that's where we come into the second term. So we're, we're, we did the P, was the P gain. Now we're onto the I, okay? So the I is the uh, integral gain. And so the integral, what it does is it's a term that sums or adds up the error over time. Um, so the output of the integral term is the accumulated error, right? Because it's adding it up, it's an accumulation. Uh, so the integral term is uh, what is used to uh, correct offset, okay? So if we're never matching our feedback to our set point, that's where the integral comes in, okay? So it eliminates that offset or tries to eliminate that offset that's left over. So here's a nice little diagram of how it works. Um, so this is showing the response of just like a, you know, a regular PID loop here. We got a little bit of overshoot here, a little bit of undershoot. But notice that there really isn't any steady state offset. Okay, it's kind of jumping around below. Um, and that's why we need the integral in there. So here's a, a little bit of an explanation on the integral. So on the uh, LSVFTs, <clears throat> We uh, use an integral time, okay, and that integral time is uh, is, is uh, referring to the integral term, and it's added to the uh, controller output, okay, kind of like a like a sampling rate almost. So the uh, shorter the integral time, more aggressively you're going to be uh, that that integral factor is going to be affecting the PID output, okay. So you're going to be eliminating that offset quicker, okay. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to put that at zero or 0 0.1 or whatever the minimum is. Uh, but if you set it too short, it's like setting your gain too high, your system can become unstable. When you have unstable, you have like hunting where you're going up, you're going down, and your speed's kind of all over the place. You don't want that. You want a nice, smooth, and stable operation. This one, again, you want to get down just a little bit at a time. So if we choose uh, different integral times, as we're showing you an example on here. Is uh, so we have a uh, case one, which we're just setting a time of one, and then the case two, where we're kind of doubling uh, the time. So after uh, six seconds, 
or six seconds, whatever your time is set to in your programming. Um, case one, you would have added a uh, 86.9 seconds. Let's say if we put a units on it, then case two would have only added, you know, a little bit more than half of that, uh, so 48.6 seconds. You see how just like a, a fine adjustment like that is going to change um, how long it takes you to correct that um, that offset. Here's another one that kind of shows how when you change your uh, your integral time, how it affects, you know, your PID, your feedback loop. Um, so we had a TI, which was representing your integral time. We have it at a one, which would be a, a low time. It's going to be pretty aggressive. OK, so that's where we have this overshoot it goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, and eventually evens out, but it's going to take some time. And I find a lot of time people don't want it to take um, a long time to uh, even out, you want to do it pretty quick. You're going to try to put this as uh, as low as possible without um, oscillating. You could go to like a number two, that'd be the next one. That one's, you know, a little bit of overshoot, a little bit of undershoot, and that smooths out pretty quick. Five, you can see that's too high. It never catches up at all. Well, it does, but who knows how long that is. Uh, so on this example here, I'd say, you know, setting this to like a two would probably be the, uh, option you could do. Uh, these parameters that we're going to mention shortly, um, these parameters you can all change on the fly. So you could be running your pump, you could be running your fan, and you could be adjusting these gains in these times, and you could see how it affects the operation. That's usually what we'll end up doing if we're ever helping somebody out with this, is we'll just be running the motor and changing these parameters and say, hey, how does it run now? How does it run now? How does it run now? That's the best way to do it. I've been mentioning overshoot um, a few times already, um, but kind of you want, might want to know what it is. So overshoot is uh, when we're overcompensating for an error. Okay, so remember the error is the difference between your feedback and your set point. And so if there's a big difference and your parameters are pretty aggressive, uh, so your P gain and your I time are aggressive, you're going to have some overshoot. So you're going above the set point. Okay, so that could be like a high pressure situation. And then it's going to compensate again in the other direction. So it's going to go a little bit lower to correct that. And so it's kind of like fighting each other, right? It overshoots, then it undershoots, overshoots and undershoots. And then gradually it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. It's going to plane off and then it'll be smooth. But if you have uh, an issue like this with an overshoot, um, then you've got to mess around with your gain. Maybe decrease your gain a little bit, see if that helps. And then uh, increase your integral time a little bit, see if that helps. Um, usually what I'd recommend for people is that you're messing around with um, tuning a uh, PID loop. You want to just uh, change one parameter at a time. If I wouldn't like, hey, oh, let's change our gain and our integral all at once. Uh, I'd change one first, see how it reacts, and change the other, see how it reacts. See what one is helping more. Every application is different, so there's really no one set of parameters that works for everybody. Uh, I'll show you guys some documents later where we can get pretty close. To uh, a nice stable operation out of the box, but it depends on how big your system is, what your pump curve is, if you have leaks in your pipe, you know, um, lots of different variables that could affect this. All right. So let's see. Let me see. I see a couple questions here. So, uh, how many uh, AD loops can you program in each drive? So it depends on the drive. Most most of the drives are going to have at least one PID loop. I think the um, IS7 and the H100 have at least two. With the H100 is going to have, I think, the most. It might have might have three. I would have to check. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, yeah, but most of the drives are going to have one, of course. And if you need more than one, I'd recommend like an H100 or something. Um, and then does this work with an auto tune? Really unrelated to an auto tune. An auto tune is uh, for tuning the drive uh, to the motor, and uh, so what what yeah what this tuning is doing is it's tuning the uh, PID loop. Um, yeah, so it's yeah it's a totally separate process. The uh, auto tune for tuning the drive to a motor is just for um, you know making sure the motor is going to run as efficiently as possible off of the VF. Next up, we have uh, 
the uh, derivative gain. So uh, derivative gain, this is the D, okay? So we talked about the P, I, and now we're onto the D, okay? So we're kind of on the last term here. Um, first thing to keep in mind is the derivative is not really used that often, okay? So we're not gonna spend too much time on it, um, but it is an interesting thing. Uh, so what the derivative gain is used is it's applied to the rate of change of the error. That's all the derivative effects is it, it affects the rate of change of the error. That's what this term applies to. Um, so what it could do is it kind of exerts like a braking action on the controller's overshoot um, because it, it's looking at how fast the set point and the controller variables are converging, okay? When they're sitting like, uh, when they're hitting the same point here, see where these are crossing here, that's what it's trying to guess, okay? That's why this guy here has his little crystal ball as he's trying to predict the future. He's trying to predict what's going to happen, and he's going to kind of counteract um, what's going on with there. So uh, on our drives in particular, um, what these, uh, these plus VFDs do is they allow us to uh, input a derivative time, okay? And so when we're talking about time on this term, um, longer the time, longer the derivative time, or D time, I believe they call it, more aggressively, the derivative factor is gonna affect the output, okay? So turn it up and then it's more aggressive. If you turn it up too high, well then you're gonna have same thing like a gain, the P gain, you're gonna have some unstable operation. You see some pretty nasty uh, signals down here, okay? So TD represents our derivative time. If you have like a value of 0.1, if you have very long cycles. If you have a value of uh, 0.7, it's like a little bit of overshoot and then nice and stable. That's probably the best one here. And if you have this at really high at like a 4.5, it's just totally off. That's way too high. As you can see, it's like kind of oscillating above and then it eventually stables out, but it looks like it takes a lot of time. So in this example, like a uh, 0.7 uh, gain or, or uh, 0.7 time, for your derivative time would be the best one in this example. All right, so now those are the three main terms, okay? Uh, so now we're gonna get into some of the some of the interesting things you'll see if you set up a PID loop. So the first is uh, integral windup. So in a PI or PID loop, so if you guys ever hear, oh, I need a PI loop, or I need a PID loop, they're really the same thing, but one, now you guys know uses the D, which is the derivative term, whereas another one just the PI loop. Um, so in the LSVFT, the derivative term is actually disabled by default, um, which is the PI loop. And 99% of the time, a PI loop is fine. You really don't need a derivative. Um, so what we're talking about here is what's called integral lineup. So if uh, your PID controller and the output is ever saturating, um, the integral portion is going to continue to accumulate that error. So it's going to keep adding error, adding error, adding error, adding error. Um, and then if you ever change a set point to a level that doesn't require that saturation, the loop is just not going to be able to react in time and it's not going to be able to track the changes in the integral. Um, so it's going to be so backed up with error, it's going to be very sluggish. And what that's called is called uh, integral windup. Okay, so it's just like saturating, you know, your PI controller with error. Okay, um, so what we could do is uh, we have the I term clear input. Okay, so some drives have um, like a uh, integral uh, limit where you can limit the integral. Uh, what we have is we have a digital input. You could uh, program and you could uh, put that switch on, then you could reset your integral, and then it's going to be a little bit more responsive because it's clearing out that error. Okay, it's clearing out that wind up we're seeing and describing here. Okay, this is just kind of showing uh, how, like, you could see that uh, integral wind up um, pop up on your application. So, uh, if we look at this top line here, the solid line is your set point, um, and then this uh, dashed and dotted line is your PI output. Okay, so if you have your set point at 100%, so some value. Okay, and then, um, you change your set point, but your parameters are not set properly, you're gonna have this integral term keep climbing up and it's gonna saturate. It's gonna hit like a very high level. So that, when that occurs and you change your set point, you have all this integral in here, okay? You can think of it, you use the term like an integral basket, okay? You go things in the basket one at a time. And then when you take things out, you can't just dump out the basket. You gotta take it out one at a time, okay? But it's gonna back up 
the same way that tracks down. Okay, that's what this bottom integral term is showing. So since we have all this integral in there, it's going to, you know, make things a little more sluggish. So if you have a sudden change in set point, you're like, oh, this this pressure is too high. I'm going to lower it a bit. It's going to take a while for the drive's output to respond to that. Okay, so that can cause problems and make your uh, system a little bit more sluggish. So that's where we have like the I term here. Um, yeah. So when when would derivative be needed? Very rarely. <laughs> um, in my past uh, is almost four years here at LS, I've only used the derivative term one time. Um, and in my previous position at Yaskawa, I've probably used it twice. So, uh, I've only used derivative when I, you're really getting into the weeds, when you've spent a whole day trying to troubleshoot a PID loop and it's still not acting right. That's when you mess around with the derivative. But it's really on like an as needed basis. Um, I can't name specific examples um, off the top of my head, but I usually just a PI loop is more than enough for most of the applications we run into. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, derivative is very seldomly used. All right. Hopefully you're not too confused. I know we talked about a lot of easy stuff there, but it's really, it's not that bad. Hopefully your mind didn't put too much. So what I'm going to show you guys now is really how simple it is. Okay, so that was all a lot of theory, and hopefully everybody's still with me because we talked about a lot of fun words like integrals and derivatives and proportionals and, and stuff like that. But I'm going to show you guys how easy it is to set up on our drives um, and how, how easily you can get up and running. Okay. So we'll start out with the H100 um, because it's a little bit different. The uh, H100 parameters are slightly different than all the other guys, and if you guys uh, don't know or unaware the H100 is our fan and pump drive it's actually a little bit easier I think to set up um, and, and here's why so first off all you do is you just enable PID step one is you go to PID01 and you set it to yes and that sets up the drive in PID the next thing you're going to do is you're going to set up your uh, units okay so you're going to go to PID50 and you're going to set up your uh, your units these are going to be the units that match your transducer so if I have a 150 um, the side transducer, you're going to set 150 in PID 53, and you'll set PID 50 to PSI. Okay, you could change that to CFM or inches of water column or you know, feed or whatever you want. There's uh, plenty of units on the H100. That's one of the nice things about it. Uh, then you're going to go in there and you're going to program your set point. Uh, we call it a reference. So the set point is the value you want to maintain. So we do a lot of uh, pumping applications, so people usually set this at 60 or 70 PSI. That means their pump is going to run up to 60 PSI, and then it's going to start slowing down once it reaches that level. Uh, you're going to put that set point in PID 11. Then PID 10 is where is your set point coming from, which usually we leave that at a default of keypad. So people usually don't adjust their set point too often. It's kind of like a set it and forget it thing. Um, and the last thing we got to do is step three. We just got to tell the drive where our feedback is set up uh, or feedback is wired up to. So PID 20 is where you do that. Uh, most commonly, you're going to use terminal I2. Terminal I2 is a 4 to 20 milliamp input. And most transducers are 4 to 20 milliamp. Um, and uh, the reason why most transducers are 4 to 20 milliamp is because it's a current loop. So if uh, you ever break a wire or if it's miswired or anything like that you could actually trip out on a feedback loss um if you don't set up a feedback loss and you disconnect your wire on your transducer the drive's going to see that as zero pressure or zero feedback and it's going to run full speed which could cause issues um so that's why a lot of transducers are 4 to 20 million um and then another common question we get is how are you going to wire it up well, uh, all of our drives have a 24 volt power supply that you have access to. So on the H100, I think it's like 150 milliamps. That's more than enough for a transducer. You just put your power wire on 24, your signal wire on I2. You have like a third wire for like a common. Uh, you just put that on like CM, which is just a common. But the two wires just wired up like this. Okay. And then you're good to go. And that's all you'd have to do for setting up an H100. G100, S100, IS7, these are uh, similar, slightly different than the H100, okay? And I'm going to have, I have a little video here, I'll show you guys where you can see how it works. I'll show you that in a minute. 
the same three general steps. You enable PID is a different parameter, okay? Then AP or APP, if you have the keypad, uh, APP1, you set that to a yes. That enables your PID. Uh, the second one here is one that people sometimes forget. The uh, drive defaults to a process PID, but you actually want to set it to a normal PID. If you use process PID and you have any other um, uh, speed sources on the drive, it's going to add that as like a trim. If you have like a keypad reference of 10 hertz, it's going to add a 10 hertz reference to your PID loop and cause some unexpected things. We recommend setting it to normal PID. So those are the first two parameters. After that, you're going to do the exact same stuff. You're going to do your scaling. The big difference here is uh, H100 is like our HVAC, our fan and pump drive. Okay, so we have units. We have PSI. We have uh, you know inches of water column. You know flow units, all that good stuff. But G100, S100, and IS7, they're kind of more general purpose uh, in industrial drives, you know, kind of tossing on anything. So these, they don't have all those fancy units. They just have a percentage. So all these units are going to be in a percentage. But uh, you can turn the percentage up to 300% uh, by default. So you would set your maximum pressure transducer value or whatever your unit is in uh, AP or APP43. If you had 150 PSI transducer, you just knock off that PSI and set this to 150%. Okay. So you're kind of setting a gain of your uh, feedback to 150%. You program your set point reference source in APP20. Usually you leave that a keypad. And the last thing you would do is um, in your set point in APP19. And it's tricky because this is a percentage, okay? So it's a percentage of that feedback scaling you did before, okay? Um, so if it's 100%, it's easy, okay? 50% of 100% is 50%. But 50% of 150% is a little bit different, and sometimes people are surprised. There's a little bit of calculation there. Um, but hopefully it's nothing surprising. Uh, the last step is just getting your feedback going, okay? You need to go to AP, APP21, and then all you do is pick the terminal. You have your feedback word to I2, I1, on like an IS7. Um, you could also do 0 to 10 on these, but I'm just showing you most commonly how it would be set up. Um, always watch out for polarity. Um, current loops are pretty sensitive. So you, you swap your two wires, uh, your I2 and your 24, you're not going to get any feedback, and then your pump uh, is going to be running full speed, and you're going to be wondering what's going on. Uh, so that'd be something you want to be careful with. Here I have a video that kind of shows how we uh, we set this up. Uh, so this example is on an S100. So this would be the same on a uh, S7, and it'd also be the same on the G100. Um, the only difference is that you don't have you can't use this keypad on the G100. So the keypad navigation and stuff like that would be slightly different. All right, so here we have a defaulted uh, S100 drive, and we're going to show how easy it is to set up PID. So you're primarily going to be in the APP group. Here's APP. First thing you have to do is enable PID. So that's parameter one. You set that to process PID. And since this is a process PID, it'll add your main reference or any pre-programmed reference to your PID loop. So we don't want that happening most of the time. So we're going to go down to number 28. And we're going to set this to a normal PID, not a process PID. And the next thing we need to do is we need to do the scaling and the units. So we're going to go down a little bit until we get to 43. Uh, this is our unit gain. So if you had a 150 PSI transducer, you would set this up to 150. So keep in mind this is a percentage, so we, we don't have the possibility to set this to like a PSI or inches of water column or some kind of other unit. Uh, and then the next thing we need to do is set up our set point. So that was our feedback. So now we need to go to uh, number 20. Our set point is set for keypad. And then we need to actually program our set point, which is right here, so 50%. So this is 50% of the scaling we just set. So 50% would be 75%, because it's 50% of 150. So 
let's just change that a little bit. I'm just going to lower it to about 40%. So there's a little bit of a calculation there since it's not like an actual, you know, unit. It's a percentage. All right, so that's all we need for our uh, basic setup here. The last thing we'll want to check is our feedback source. Uh, most of the time you're going to go ahead and set this up for like a I2, um, but I'm just running a demo here that has a speed pot, so we're going to use V1 to simulate a feedback. So now we're in PID. The next thing I'd recommend doing is uh, setting the main display. So we have three monitors. So in the CNF group, we have monitor line one, two, three. I like to leave monitor one at frequency. Monitor line two. We're gonna set that to PID reference. So that'll show our set point. And then the third line and the bottom line, we're gonna set this to feedback. So now on our main, main screen, we can see our reference hit down we can see our feedback so as I turn my speed pot which simulates my feedback my feedback should go up feedback should go down and now if I run this feedback is at zero this bottom line here so the drive is gonna ramp up as fast as it can <clears throat> and that also comes into play with your acceleration time so it's going to go all the way up to 60 hertz. And then as your feedback approaches your set point, so as the bottom line approaches what you need to get up to for 60%. If we get right there, we can see the drive slowing down. So we're meeting demand. Our feedback is a little bit above our set point, so the drive is going to speed it down. And if you go a lot higher, it'll speed down a little bit quicker. <clears throat> And then if you drop below your set point, it'll start speeding up again once it catches up with that error. So that's a basic PID loop. So you only need to set four or five parameters. Uh, we didn't touch any of the gains or the integral time or anything like that, but this is all you need for a basic operation. I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about some of the stuff we could add. Okay, so that was a basic PID loop. All it was really doing is uh, adjusting the speed, going up and down based on your feedback, and that's really all you need for like a foundation. And you can always start adding stuff in, okay? So uh, things you can add in there are gonna be uh, asleep. So asleep, what asleep will do is it'll actually stop the VFD when the motor speed, which is same as the application demand, is low. So it's best to think of it as like a pressure system, okay? So if you have uh, if you're providing water pressure for a building, everybody goes home for the day. No more flushing of toilets. Nobody's turning on sinks or anything like that. The demand is low, right? Drive and the motor doesn't need to run anymore because the pressure is already met, you know, at set point. So in cases like that, the motor speed is going to decrease. Sometimes it can still run at like a low speed, um, but a lot of pumps or fans they don't really do much work. They don't move much air. They don't build much pressure at low speeds. Typically, people end up using sleep. So when you're running at a low speed for a certain amount of time, then the drive's just going to stop. Okay, the sleep goes active when you hit a certain speed after a certain delay time. That's what this graph down here is showing. So your feedback approaches your set point, and then it reaches your set point. Okay, and then if it's around your set point, and then your motor speed starts to slow down. Once you hit a certain speed limit and you pass up this delay time, so let's say you go to 40 hertz for 10 seconds, then it's going to activate sleep, okay? So it's going to put the drive to sleep. The drive's just going to stop, okay? Now, the next thing you'll maybe be wondering is, okay, well, how do I come out of sleep? I mean, I don't want my drive to be stopped forever. Well, that's where we have wake up. So wake up is a level that you would program that makes the drive come out of sleep, okay? And wake up also has a delay time associated with it. If we look at this little graph here, so right here, this flat bottom red line right here is the uh, drive being asleep. So if it's asleep and then your feedback drops to a certain point, so let's say your set point is 60 psi, but if you ever hit 40 psi, you want the drive to start back up. That would be like your wake up level, 40 psi. 
you know, after a minute or a few seconds, it's played for ramble. Once you hit that point, and that's when the drive wakes up, so it comes out of sleep. Okay. This shows how we would set it up on like an H100. Very, very easy to set up, it's just a couple parameters. So, first you would set where you want to go to sleep. AP1-8, this is the sleep frequency. A lot of times it's like 30 or 40 hertz, but you can change it to whatever you want based on your application. You gotta set your delay time. So how long do you want it to wait or go below that speed before it goes to sleep, activates uh, sleep? So step one and two are putting it to sleep. Step three and four are waking it up, okay? So in order for sleep to work, and to properly wake up, you, you must be setting up a wake up level, okay? Otherwise, you, your sleep's not going to work. So, AP1 10 is your wake up deviation level. So, the AP100 is a little bit different. It's not an absolute value, it's a deviation. The deviation means subtracted from your set point. So, if your set point is 60 psi and your wake up level is set for 10 psi, that doesn't mean it's going to wake up at 10 psi. It's going to wake up at 10 psi less than your set point. Would be 50 psi so just be careful with that because if you don't set it right um then you're gonna have people calling you up and you have to go back on a job site and they're gonna say this thing is like going really low pressure before it starts up again just be aware that the deviation and there's a delay time there as well okay keep in mind you gotta wake me up before you go go always gotta set a wake up all right a couple more uh, added functions here one is going to be a sleep boost uh, so sleep boost, notice it has a little asterisk, but this is only available on the H100. So with the H100 being our fan and pump drive, it has the most features for PID. Sleep boost, what it is, is it's allowing a VFD to go to sleep a little bit longer, okay? A lot of times people will think of like PID is like a, it's like a cruise control, right? When you're driving your car and you go to a certain speed and you flip on the cruise control, it's really just a PID loop. So the demand is changing because you could be going up or you could be going downhill. And that's when you'll see the RPM of your car go up or down. Okay, so that's all PID really is. Sleep boost would be like gunning it, you know, giving it giving it a little bit more gas before you coast. Okay, boosting is sleeping. Um, so what this is doing is this will be used primarily on applications which have a pressure tank. And uh, before you go to sleep, so the driver's like, all right, I'm ready to go to sleep. The man has decreased, but I want to go to sleep a little bit longer. Okay. What it's going to do is it's going to boost up your set point by whatever you program into the drive, and then it's going to go to sleep. But overpressures the system, you know, fills up your pressure tank a little bit, and then it goes to sleep. And what that does is it allows you to sleep a little bit longer. So that way you have less oscillating, you have less turning on and off, a little bit less wear and tear on, you know, the pump and the motor and all the mechanics associated with it. That's why people would use a sleep boost. Available only on the H100. So the next thing we usually run into is a uh, PID open loop. If you ever have an application that has an HOA or a uh, handoff auto switch, um, you'll end up using PID open loop to switch between hand and auto, okay? So you'll pick out whatever input you want to use, you know, usually like P3, P4, P5, something like that. That's going to be in your IN, your input group, and you're going to program whatever input you want to PID open loop, okay? So when you switch on and go to like a hand mode that's going to look at whatever's programmed in frq or drv07 depending on what drive you're looking at and then when you open it then it's going to start running pid again okay so that's why they call it pid open loop it's like disabling pid that's what that term means right there you're going between pid and then your hand reference could be it could be a keypad reference uh, it could be a speed pot but it's ignoring your pid setup so that's the purpose of PID open loop. But keep, keep that in mind. It's very easy to set up. It's just one parameter. So one of the last things we'll mention here is uh, inverse acting PID. So this is actually uh, inverting the output of the PID block. Okay, so this is for applications such as like a cooling tower or like a pump down situation. And so it's just one parameter that you change that says invert output act or something like that. Um, so as your feedback is increasing, your speed is also going to increase. So in that video I was showing, as your feedback increased, dry speed decreased, right? Because you're building up to like a certain pressure. Once you reach that pressure, you don't need to run any faster. It's closed end. If you think of an application like a tank level, so in this diagram right here, 
let's say we need to keep this tank level at 10 feet and the VFD is controlling a pump that is pumping down. So it's removing water from that tank. The tank is also being filled up by a secondary pump, okay? So in this case, the VFD is controlling the pump that's uh, you know, removing water from the tank. The pump is gonna run faster as the level rises. We wanna maintain 10 feet. If we go up to 11 feet, it's gonna be running faster and faster because we don't wanna overfill that tank. That'd be pumped down. We're pumping down the level of the tank be the same setup you guys saw in that video, same setup as you guys saw on the slides, but you would just change one more parameter to invert the output, okay? We do run into this occasionally. <laughs> All right, so these, these are just kind of a few things I want to make you guys be aware of. These are the last uh, couple slides I have. Um, so first off, I'm not sure if uh, all of you guys are aware, but we do offer a uh, lead lag um, firmware. Uh, we're working on making the standard, but right now it's like a like a custom firmware we could get for you guys. Um, so this is for the H100. Uh, lead lag is uh, something you're going to use for PID operation. That's why I'm mentioning it. And um, what it is is, uh, let me kind of bring up this flyer here. This flyer it should be on our website. If not, you guys have our emails, you could always ask about it. You could run up to eight drives connected, um, just with a twisted pair, which is just a Modbus connection, okay, RS-485. The drives are going to communicate with each other in a lead lag arrangement. So if this drive number one can't keep up, then this drive number two is going to come on. Then you could also have them alternate. So if you want this one to come on every 24 hours and alternate with this one the next day and then back and forth, it's a good way to you know minimize pump wear and keep things going. Okay. So the main purpose of this is to eliminate PLCs. You don't need a SCADA system to control your drives. All the logic is in the drives itself. Uh, it's all in the firmware, and all you have to really do is just, you know, wire them up and then set up some parameters here. You know, you could eliminate downtime because if one drive fails, the other one will kick on. You could run up to eight H100 drives together. Um, yeah, automatically assignment of the lead drive, just a lead lag arrangement. Uh, we have Gaki pump support. If you have like a booster system that has two big drives and one little drive, you could have the little drive take priority for like a pressure maintenance, you know, because this is going to consume a lot of less energy than uh, the bigger guys. Uh, you know, you still get all the standard uh, H100 features that you guys are used to. So, yeah, lead, lead lag is something to keep in mind. If you guys ever have an application with more than one drive, or this is a picture of uh, one of our customers out, uh, out east that is using lead lag. That was all I had. I just wanted to show you guys some of our support we're offering. It's kind of related to PID, because I know it could be overwhelming. Some of you guys are still maybe confused. Hopefully not. Hopefully we tried to clear it up. Uh, but some things we have to offer. So first, I want to show you guys, this is something new we've been working on, which is our knowledge base. Um, so our knowledge base, let me open up this. This is a new database uh, repository for different information on any topic you can think of. There's FAQs, there's application notes, installation guides, troubleshooting, all kinds of stuff. So if you were just to go here and search PID, uh, you got some PID stuff that's going to come up. I'm going to hit enter, and then it's going to list uh, every single thing uh, that's there for PID. So this is still kind of new. So we have like seven different articles on PID, like, hey, how do I set up PID? Here we go, a nice explanation. Here's the parameters and stuff. And here's like how you'd set the monitor. So this is actually exactly what I did in the video, okay? So um, how you guys would get access to this is uh, we're working on getting it on our website. Um, but right now we don't have it on our website. So if you guys want a quick link, you go to our LS Electric America page, click the FAQ section. And the first FAQ is a link takes you to the new FAQ website as we're kind of transitioning over. So keep that in mind. Um, there's a lot, a lot of good stuff on there. Um, also on our website, we have a PID quick reference guide, which has all the parameters on there. And that's just under the download section. Um, you can always give us a call at our 800 number, um, or you could call a John or I direct or your sales guys if you need to. Um, as well, you guys know that we have plenty of experience with this, and this is probably the most common thing we're people out with every day and setting up PID loops. Like 50% of the time I'm helping somebody set up a PID loop. So it's a very common thing. 
We got a lot of experience on this. Uh, this is a picture of one of our demo units is a ping pong ball demo, which is running a PID loop where you could regulate how high or low that ping pong ball goes in the tube. That's kind of a neat little demo. Um, so if there's any questions, uh, please put them in the chat now, and then we'll take a minute to answer them if there's any more questions. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free to hang out and put some questions in there. I don't see any now. Um, if you guys want copies of these slides, we could send them out. If you, uh, I'd say, you know, shoot me an email, uh, shoot tech support an email. Um, you could shoot your uh, regional guy um, an email. So Dave in the east, Gary in the Midwest, and then Andy uh, is covering the uh, Southwest and West regions. 